Okay, this is going to be the first lesson in Chapter 3, and it's going to be about functions. We're going to review some of the things you learned last year. So when you determine whether relations are functions, a relation pairs inputs with outputs. When a relation is given as ordered pairs, the x-coordinates are the inputs and the y-coordinates are the outputs. A relation that pairs each input with exactly one output is a function. So determine whether the relation is a function and explain. So when I look at all of the x values in number 1, negative 5, 0, 5, and 5, I can see right here that 5 is paired with 0 and 5 is paired with 10. There's no rule mathematically that would have you put in a value of 5, do a calculation, and spit out two different quantities. So we would say that it is not a function for that reason. So not a function, 5 is paired with two different outputs. Okay, looking at number 2, the inputs, negative 4, negative 1, 2, and 5 are all different. The outputs are different. You could have two different inputs going to the same output. That would still be a function, even though that doesn't apply to this case. Each input is paired with distinctly different outputs. So, this is a function. For that reason, it's a function because every input has exactly one output. Okay, looking at our input x for 3 and our output y. They, it is a function because every input has exactly one output. Okay. And looking at the mapping diagram, so we can see our ordered pairs, we can see a table in number 3, and we have a mapping diagram in number 4. And the mapping diagram pairs the input with the output, and notice that the 1 half for x is going to three different values for y, so it is not a function. because the input one-half has three outputs. So this brings us to another core concept, which is the vertical line test. A graph represents a function when no vertical line passing through more than one point of the graph. Okay, so an example of a function when you draw the dotted line, which is a vertical line, you can see that it is only going through one distinct point, and that happens at every point along the way. For the non-function example, you can see that when the vertical line is drawn, it crosses over two points in the graph. Therefore, it is not a function. So let's try some. Determine whether the graph represents a function, and I would recommend that you you know, pass your pencil along or even lift it up and try to, you know, use it as a guide. So for 5, it is a function. You could say that it passes the um, vertical line test. No vertical line can be drawn through more than one point. Okay, so the reason is it passes the vertical line test. All right, for six, if you do the vertical line test, it is also a function for the same region because it passes the vertical line test.
four, seven. When you do the vertical line test, it fails. So it is not a function because it fails the vertical line test. And eight, when you do the vertical line test, you see that it is a function because it passes vertical line test. So finding the domain and range of a function. Again, this is review. The domain and range of a function. Domain is the set of all possible input values, also known as the x values. The range of a function is the set of all possible output values. Those are the y values. So you can see this little illustration of a function machine. Um, you put in a number, crunch, 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 and you spit out the output or the value. So find the domain and range represented by the graph. So when we see, number nine, each distinct point, we can tell the domain, right? The domain is the x value. So the leftmost point is at negative two. There's a point that is graphed at negative one. There is one graphed at zero on the x. The x value of 1 has a point and the x value of 2. When we look at the range, we're looking at the y values. And the lowest or, you know, lowest one on the y value, so going least to greatest, would be 0. There are two things graphed at 2, and there are two things graphed at 4. So the range is from 0 to 4. Looking at 10, this one's going to be difficult because you can see that it is a continuous line and curve. It is a function because it passes the vertical line test, but it's almost like there's a range of values that are true. And so we can use what we learned about those compound inequalities to describe our domain. So our domain, because it's a closed dot at 1, are all the values that are less than and equal to x, right? And x is less than or equal to 5 because it goes from 1 to 5, kind of a continual thing for the x numbers. So now look at the y values, right? From 0 to 4 for y, and again because of the closed dot we have 0 is less than or equal to the y values which is less than or equal to 4. So now we have a reason to use our compound inequalities to describe everything included in that function or represented by the domain and range. You may recall from last year that we identified independent and dependent variables. The variable that represents the input value of a function is independent because it can be any value in the domain. The variable that represents the output value of a function is dependent because it depends on the value of the independent variable or x. When an equation represents a function, the dependent variable is defined in terms of the independent variable. So the, tip, the statement y is a function of x means that y vary depending on the value of x. So look at our slope intercept form. y is equal to negative x plus 10. They're pointing to the dependent variable or y. So let's just kind of summarize here all the different values that we have for each of these. Like um, if we're talking about our x value, right? We also know it to be our input. We know it to be our domain. And it is an independent variable, meaning it could be almost anything, right? A lot of examples are temperatures and the cost and things like that are independent. Um, 
For the y value, we know it by several names as well. It is the output. It is the range. And it is the dependent variable. So in our final example for today, <clears throat> we are asked, we're given a function, and it represents the number A of avocados you have left after making B batches of guacamole, and you need to identify the independent and dependent variables. So in this case, even if you want to think about um, the slope-intercept form of the equation, I'm going to write that down over here. So y is equal to mx plus b. You can kind of look at the location of where the y value is and where the x value is. So the independent variable is the x variable. So that would be the b or um, batches of guacamole. So independent would be batches. Well, I'm just going to write B. Okay, so that's B. And the dependent variable then would be A. So if we're given the domain, remember that the domain is the independent, okay? It's the X value. What is the range or the Y value? So we can kind of set up a table. Um, my independent and then you can put in what the rule is um, the negative 4b plus 14 so that you can get the dependent variable so when b is 0 1 2 and 3 we can actually perform the rule so negative 4 times 0 plus 14 is going to be 14 for that value and then when we have um, negative 4 times 1, we'll have an output of 10. Negative 4 times 2 would be 6. And negative 4 times 3 would be 2. So our range would then be listed in least to greatest order. Um, doesn't really matter. 14, 10, and this is greatest to least actually, 6 and 2. So let's look at 12. <clears throat> For example, 4. The function is given T is equal to 19M plus 65, and it represents the temperature T in degrees Fahrenheit of an oven after preheating for M minutes. So we want the independent, which in this case would be the minutes. Remember I told you that sometimes it's units of time, so M or minutes. The dependent would be T or temperature. If the re recipe calls for an oven temperature of 350 degrees, describe the domain and range of the function. So if our T is now 3. 50, substituting it into the equation and solving make sure that's a 19 We get um, that the number of minutes it would take would be 15 minutes for it to reach 350. So it's a continual graph, though. It's not discrete points. So we're talking about preheating an oven. So our domain in this case is 
the domain or the independent or the number of minutes, time starts at zero. So zero would be less than or equal to m, which is less than or equal to 15. And our range, now we're going to be talking about the temperature. Notice that right here represents this value 65 will be less than or equal to the temperature, which is less than or equal to 350 degrees. So that three, that 65 is, is, you know, about room temperature. So that's why that's temperature is starting at about that temperature and then getting up to or climbing to 350. And so we have to show that it's a range or a continual thing. So the graph is one of those continual lines instead of discrete points on a graph.